Okay, good evening, everyone. So we take advantage of the... So we take advantage of a little bit of the interactivity in the media. Uh, you can click on the links. Um, a little ocean for the that old Yiddish lullaby, um, which might be the, might be the, um, might be the soundtrack, let's say, for tonight's discussion, which is, last time we discussed, we discussed what European Jewry was like. No, I'm sorry, last time we discussed what is modern Jewish history. Um, when does it begin? What are the characteristics of modern Jewish history? What are the characteristics of modernity altogether? And how and when do Jews enter that period? What are the uh, what are the um, the stop signs along the way that indicate that somehow we've we've moved from pre-modern society to modern society? Obviously, again, it didn't all happen in well one fell swoop. On one, on one day, um, uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit about what was Jewish culture, civilization, society like in the pre-modern era, on the on the eve of the pre-modern pre-modern era in in Europe, of course, um, in Europe, of course. Um, the, the links to these uh, YouTube videos, if you search Oifen uh, on, uh, on YouTube, you'll, you'll, find, uh, you'll find links to different editions of this great lullaby. I just sent you a link. Oifen Pripachek, of course, it literally means in Yiddish, by the fireside. It's a kind of uh, nostalgic rendering of the image of the Malamid, the teacher, um, sitting by the, uh, by the fireside. Uh, teaching holidays uh, to the uh, to the children. <clears throat> um, I, I sent I sent out by email uh, a copy of that this great Yiddish story translated translated into uh, into English. I hope that we'll have a chance to talk about it uh, uh, by the end of the evening. If not, then we'll do it then we'll do it uh, next time. Okay. If you haven't had a chance to read it, then you might yet still have a chance. It's it's pretty short reading. What was the um, what was Jewish life like in in Europe? So when we ask about Jewish life in Europe in the 17th, uh, uh, even 18th centuries, we're talking about the Jews of Europe uh, who are under a Christian society and that relationship between the Jewish society and the Christian society is the all-important, all-defining, uh, and can't, of course, be divorced from its larger theological, larger theological questions of what what Judaism is in relation to that larger host society. Throughout most of the the um, the medieval period, uh, the, the concept was largely one of, with many exceptions to the rule, but it was largely one of um, of tolerance, of of tolerance, of uh, of limited tolerance, and and um, uh, uh, you know even though the theory was that the Christian society was tolerant of the Jews amongst them. In reality, 
of history often differs from theory. Uh, throughout much of that period, the church was guided by this uh, verse from the book of Psalms. We know it as a pasuk in Tehillim. Um, the context of the of the verse, you, you it might be worthwhile to look it up because it could be that church is, of course, taking it out of context. That pasuk, Al Tahargain Ten Mishpichu Ami, Ani Amo Bechelcha, Vahori Demu, Manidenu Hashem. Don't kill them. So the church is saying, again, we're, we're darshaning the Pesach according to the church uh, theology, as it were. Don't kill them, uh, the, the Jews, lest my people forget. Remove them from their possessions with your power, God, and bring them down. Holy demo. Bring them down. The Jews should not be killed. They should be tolerated. But they have to occupy a different position uh, vis-a-vis the larger society. There has to be a clear sense that they, the Jews, are not like us, the Christians. And there are all types of rules that govern how and where Jews can live. And, you know, we saw last time uh, at different periods what they could wear, how they might be identified, what occupations they could they could, um, they could uh, occupy um, in order to be clear that they would be, in order to be clear that they would be um, separate, distinct, lower than the larger Jewish society. And throughout much of the medieval period, there were different points and different places where Jews actually had to live, of course, in the ghetto. Now, one of the interesting things about Jewish history is that it's given us a, um, you know, a wealth of of you know rich vocabulary, words that are coined in different European languages and then passed into English. Um, words like Holocaust and, and ghetto, uh, are, these are all words that have their origins in, you know, in Jewish history. Um, this map of different Jewish ghettos, you can see a larger version of it. You can download just the map itself from our from our sheer homepage, which is which is useful um, to see. That the the Judengas or the Jewish ghetto um, before 1789, Jews were again largely isolated from their European neighbors. Um, even though Jewish the Jews in Europe uh, go back, uh, certainly in, in in certain parts of Europe, um, go back many 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 centuries. Uh, the, the earliest you know Jewish settlements amongst Christian Europe probably date to the to the fourth century. Um, but the the Christian society was always interested in um, you know making it clear that 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 um, the Jews were different that they were not equal um, neither in status nor in their economic uh, position or in their political position or in their security position. Tehillah asks an interesting question which we'll we'll come back to. Um, uh, well, and that is precisely this is it. In other words, the, the, the ghettos, whether they were walled cities or they were areas where the Jews lived um, in isolation from from larger society, uh, never completely cut off because there was always some form of of commerce going on. But in terms of day to day interaction, the, the the ghettos meant not only Jewish isolation, but also Jewish autonomy. There was a sense of, in medieval society, of what, what was known as corporativism, that the society was divided up into, uh, into separate, uh, very often autonomous bodies, corporations, as it were, not, not in the contemporary sense of, uh, of IBM, uh, corporate of individual of individual bodies, um, not of individuals. It's the innovation of 1789. It's the innovation of 1776 that we discussed last time was the recognition that the individual has sovereign rights. This is an innovation at the end of the 18th century because before it there really is no such notion as an individual, as an autonomous 
uh, uh, being who's entitled to rights. Your rights, the rights of any individual, were invested in him based upon what rung he occupied in part of a larger, in part of a larger, a larger group. Um, uh, and, and that plays into the feudal system that existed where there were clear hierarchies and everybody understood where they where they where they sat on the on the ladder. Um, that feudal system which comes about in the in the eighth century and the ninth century in Europe has the king at the top who 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 rules with the divine right of kings. And he, the king, decentralizes responsibilities and concomitant rights that go along with responsibilities that, that he can't perform. As in theory, the king is the king of the entire kingdom, and he's in control of everything. But in reality, since that's not always something which is possible to, to execute over too large an area, so he has to divvy out, he has to divvy out uh, responsibilities to other people, and therefore he also has to divvy out rights to other people to get them to do what he needs them to to do. So, for example, there'll be a baron who who will collect uh, tolls and send a percentage up to the king, and this leads to s different small corporate uh, units within the kingdom: the manor, the parish, the town, the guild, the even even the university. Um, uh, the European universities are part of this. Everything is incorporated based upon the blessing, uh, the imprimatur of the of the king, who in theory stands at the head of everything. Even think of cultural institutions. Can anybody think of a medieval cultural institution that you know, probably bears, I would like to think, some uh, meaning in the modern world, um, in, in our modern Western culture, but which which existed as a, as an as a uh, an organ of the throne. I'm thinking about England specifically. Can anybody think of of an example like this? Right. I'm thinking of Shakespeare's Theatre Company was incorporated by by the throne. They were meant to be the theater company for for Queen Elizabeth. And um, uh, the the fact that that uh, you know other people could buy tickets and go see it uh, was incidental to the fact that they they were incorporated as a theater company with the imprimatur of the of the British royal throne. In the eighteenth century at least in, in Western Europe, at least in Western Europe, um, the um, uh, there, there were about 400,000 Jews. There were about 400,000 Jews in Western Europe in the 18th century. They can't be organized um, into the feudal society because since they, since Jews, since we were not part of the Christian society, since we couldn't swear oaths of of, of fealty, we can't we can't get in through the normal the normal ladder. Um, um, but um, and and we can't be dealt with as individuals since there's no such concept. So therefore, the Jewish communities were given uh, were given a certain amount of autonomy, a certain amount of leeway to be self-governing, to be self-governing. Um, and this was really, generally speaking, considered to be a pretty good deal for the Jews, because as long as this type of tolerance, um, this minimal amount of tolerance, held out. And there were pogroms, another another great uh, word added to the lexicon from Jewish history, pogrom. As long as there weren't pogroms or the Crusades or other things that happened along the way, this kind of worked pretty well. That the Jews were left to their own, to govern themselves, 
as a corporate entity unto themselves granted that right under under the uh, under the king and the Jewish communities developed all different types of institutions to to govern itself. Sherry asks me a question about Jewish population of uh, the Jewish percentage of the total population. I, I, I don't have a figure. I'm sure a second of Googling you can find it on your own. Um, but it was pretty small. It was it was probably never more than a half a percent or so um, uh, or a percent. But what happened was that the Jews lived in, in dense concentrations. So if you knew one Jew, if you if you saw one Jew, you probably saw lots of Jews. So depending upon where you where you live, you the the non-Jew, um, either you didn't know any Jews, or they were probably all over the place uh, because of uh, them living in um, <laughs> living in close proximity, kind of like going to Borough Park, as the uh, points out. In the Jewish uh, communities, in the in the Jewish self-governed communities, there were different um, there were these different institutions. The educational institution, of course, most famously was the Cheder, or the Talmud Torah. These were small, um, hard to call them schools. They were for boys only. Um, generally speaking, boys were sent to school um, to learn reading and writing, um, uh, Chumash, Mishnah. Uh, others would progress further depending upon their their family status, their financial ability, but the idea that everybody went on to higher Torah education was obviously not the case, and only the talented and promising went on to on to higher Torah education. By higher Torah education, I mean let's say high school age, um, high school age. After that, you went and you became, uh, you know, an apprentice. To the shoemaker, or to the milkman, or to, or to, or to whatever it was. Um, the uh, the judicial uh, governance of the community was done by the local bate din, the local Jewish court. That really, uh, <laughs> I see we're uh, we're, uh, we're 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 quoting uh, and verse uh, uh, from. Uh, from the uh, from the fiddler uh, soundtrack, um, right? At three, I started Hebrew school. At ten, I learned a trade. I hear they picked a bride for me. I hope she's pretty. I think that's the I think that's the snippet of the song you're you're, you're looking for. The the Bakli Din were um, were uh, in charge of governing the community. They made they wrote. They made takanot. They made they passed yeah, internal legislation that uh, rules and regulations uh, beyond, of course, the, their role in, in uh, implementing and interpreting halakha, uh, but the governance of the community. The most important tool of the most important tool of the um, of the community is, of course, cherem. Is cherem. We we know about cherem today. If you do something. If somebody writes a book that uh, that has ideas that are deemed to be of questionable provenance, so the rabbonim will put a harem on the book, or maybe even on its author, um, literally to excommunicate them. But it's not something that has the same type of teeth it once did. In the medieval ages, harem was an extremely powerful punishment, and the threat of it alone was enough to to really um, to keep everyone in line. Um, anybody have any speculation for why that is? Why why harem in in the pre-modern period was so powerful? What what would happen if you were put right? So in Sherry's right, the community was everything in their lives, but why? It's not just that others couldn't do business with you. What did you lose if you were put in harem?
Yeah, in New York. No, uh, nowhere else to go. In other words, losing your connection to the community was would be dramatic because the community is your whole life. But again, as an individual in medieval Europe, you don't exist. You have no rights at all. You have no protections at all. Whatever rights you have, the very right to live in your house on that land, which belongs to the king, is granted to you by charter through the community. That's why the Jewish community is happy. We have these pinkasim, um, these, these the pinkasim, uh, the the the, the um, the like the census list of the communities because if, if, if you got married it was written in the book and if you had children they were written in the book and if you get into Kherim we cross your name out and that's precisely what happens that's precisely what happens in one of the most famous Kharamim of this period to Spinoza to Baruch Spinoza Spinoza philosopher, a European philosopher of great note in the 17th century, lives from 1632 to 1677 in Amsterdam. He's part of the Spartak Jewish community in Amsterdam. The Spartak Jewish community in Amsterdam was made up largely of uh, exiles from Spain at the end of the 15th century um, and, uh, and conversos moranos, uh, you know, uh, Jews that were in hiding who then get out of uh, out of uh, the Iberian Peninsula and make their way to, to Amsterdam. There are other communities that become centers of, of the exiles in Spain, but uh, Amsterdam is one of them. Spinoza was a philosopher who, um, how do we say, uh, um, uh, you know, had some ideas which were really uh, uh, contravened uh, conventional Jewish philosophical notions. And after various uh, warnings, he was put into excommunication, into Cherem, on July 27, 1656. And this is the text, in English, of course, of the, of the Cherem, of the decree that was signed by the, the leaders of the community, um, the seniors of the Mahmad. This looks, this is Mahmad, the, the, uh, the Mahmad, the, the, um, the, the, um, a committee of, uh, of scholars that uh, are passing the the um, the harem against Spinoza because they've been long aware, being cognizant of the wrong opinions and behavior of Baruch de Spinoza. Right, his behavior is not in accord with halacha, but perhaps even more significant, his opinions that he possesses, disseminates, teaches heretical ideas. And they've tried various means and premises to dissuade him from his evil ways, but as they effected no improvement, obtaining on the contrary more information every day of the horrible heresies which he practiced and taught, and of the monstrous actions which he performed, and as they had many trustworthy witnesses who in the presence of Spinoza reported and testified against him and convicted him, etc., etc., etc. So they decide that Spinoza should be excommunicated and separated from the people of Israel. Now when it says separated from the people of Israel, they don't say that, they don't mean that he's not, they don't mean They, they don't mean that he's not a Jew. On the contrary, we operate under the principle as outlined in the Gemara in Sanhedrin and elsewhere, Yisrael, Afalpi Shechata Yisrael Hu. That, that there's no way out. That if you are Jewish, no matter how sinful you are, even if somebody were to convert to a different religion, there's no such thing really in Judaism. We don't, we don't recognize that as having any um, legitimacy. You're still a Jew in the eyes of the Jewish, in the eyes of the Jewish community. So when the Cherem says 
that he's separating from the people of Israel, it doesn't mean that he's not a Jew. It means that he's no longer a member of the community, and therefore he's on his own. It's like being blasted out into outer space. He's suddenly adrift in a society where it's impossible to exist as an individual. You only exist insofar as you're a member of some kind of corporate entity. And that's why the case of Spinoza, notwithstanding, the, the, the case of Spinoza, notwithstanding, um, um, Cherem was usually a very, very, very effective uh, stick by which to keep everyone to keep everyone in line. The, the 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 section here is the actual text of the um, the Cherem. It follows a certain traditional uh, traditional nusach, traditional uh, formula uh, about the judgment of the angels and the saints. It's a kind of flowery way of uh, of the saying that, uh, that we're about to do what we're, we're about to do. Um, and it includes the, the, the results are that nobody should communicate with him orally or in writing, show him any favor, stay with him under the same roof, come with him, arba amot, within uh, four, let's say four, uh, four meters of him, or read anything composed or written by him. Of course, that's the most significant because they sensed a danger in these heretical in these heretical teachings of Spinoza. So it's not just that they wanted to punish him, they wanted to isolate him from from everyone from everyone else. So that's the second kind of characteristic of of um, of the Jewish community. The first being the education, the second being the Bakedin and the third being a whole network of social welfare. Of, you know, if the harem and the batidin is the stick, then the carrot um, is the chesed and the charity and the staka and the chebra kadisha and the damach and the, all of the things that some cheshabis and the tamchui and all the manner in which the Jewish community cared for itself and for its own to take care of the sick, to take care of the widow, to take care of the orphan, uh, to, 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 to help the poor, etc., etc., etc. These were very, very, very well organized um, institutions uh, that were part of the community. So because of this, the center of Jewish life uh, becomes the Bate Knesset, becomes the shul, and, um, and, and the general government really doesn't interfere all that much. Um, okay, let me just look at these questions. Was his writing true? Radical religious theory out of his time? Uh, no, I think that if you look at uh, uh, um, Spinoza's, Spinoza's writing was indeed heretical, um, not merely about, not merely about, uh, um, about um, the divinity of the Torah, but even about God. I mean, it's, it's briefly stated, and you know, if you look him up in the encyclopedia, you can you can round out your education. Uh, essentially, he identifies. He doesn't deny that there's um, a type of God, but he identifies God more as a, a type of a natural force, let's say, instead of the kind of conventional uh, personal God that we tend to think of in, in Judaism and in, and in most uh, of the great religions. So he's putting the Cherem in 1656. His name is literally crossed out in the community register, as if, I mean, Lahavdil Elif Alfei Havdalot, in Orwellian terms, it becomes a non-person. Um, In, in unperson, um, the the um, so the harem, you know, itself, of course, is is more effective than any police force. There is no police force in the ghetto. Uh, okay. 
to the community. No, the community you didn't do anything with it. The person in Cheyron didn't exist. They were gone. They had to wander the earth. They had to. They had to. They had to get out. They had to leave their home. In, in theory, I mean, it didn't always work that way. But in theory, that's that's the way it was. The the, the governing of the the governing of the communities was uh, was generally a function of all of the male householders, the Balebatim, um, um, who who would elect the Zikanim, the the city elders. Uh, the, those city elders would elect or appoint the rabbis, the tax collectors, the judges, the, the dayonim of the batidin, um, and they're the administrators of the Jewish community. Um, the, 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 the elders, the, the lay elders, these the lay leaders, were generally um, viewed as, uh, were sometimes viewed as, as oppressive figures because they were also in charge of um, they were also in charge of the tax collecting. Now remember, there's a double tax. The community has to kick up uh, a certain amount to the king, but the community also has to levy a tax in order to in order to run all of these institutions of the of the of the community. There's another um, there's another uh, there's another there's another um, uh, characteristic, and that is what's called the court Jew. The court Jew. The court Jew was the representative of the Jewish community to the to the court, to the king, to the the power. Described very well in an excellent book called Out of the Ghetto by the um, by the great uh, Jewish historian Jacob Katz. Katz died a couple of years ago. He, he was one of the uh, very important uh, um, teachers at the Hebrew University. Um, he lived into a ripe old age. Um, and uh, all of his books are extraordinarily important for the understanding of particularly of this period. Um, and this book, Out of the Ghetto, which I'm sure you can find on Amazon, I'm sure it's in print, I'm sure all of his books are still in print, um, describes the court Jew in the following way. And it, it really um, gives some insight to, it gives some insight to, uh, to, um, to, to life at the time. Let's, let's just read it together. Is there somebody else that would like to read it? There, who has a microphone? Sherry, do you have a microphone? Um, yeah, so am I. Hi, we can hear you. I'm sorry. I, I I have to run and get a knock at my door. I'll read it when I get back. Or someone else. Uh, okay, so we'll get somebody else to read. Her. So, are you with us? It's 20902. Hello, so okay, so I'll 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 take it from here. Unless we can get somebody some other brave soul. Okay, for what? So uh, we're gonna mute him. <laughs> so Pat's right, the social ascent of the court Jew in 17th and 18th century has been pointed to as undoubtedly as an undoubtedly new feature of Jewish society at that time. As a result of their important economic role, these rich Jews acquired positions of influence with those in power. The court Jew was always a rich Jew. He was always, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't become rich because he was a court Jew. He became a court Jew because he was, was rich. Now this is important because um, by the by the dawn of the modern era, during the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, the Jewish population in Europe, by and large, were really quite poor. 
there was tremendous poverty. The community did a uh, uh, heroic job in trying to maintain some standard of living and trying to make sure that people didn't literally starve to death um, uh, to take care of to take care of their own. But there was really rampant poverty uh, throughout throughout European Jewry. Although there were, of course, figures of immense wealth. The emperor, king, princes, and bishops whom, whom they served um, uh, were served by, by these rich Jews uh, in that economic role. In return for their services, they often secured privileges for themselves. Some of them were exempted from paying the Schutzgeld, which was a type of a protection money, a type of tax. That was a basic condition of the Jews' right toleration in certain places. The court Jew might also secure the right of residence for his family, his widow or his sons-in-law, in places, let's say, in the city, outside of outside of the restricted Jewish, you know, uh, you know, the, the the restricted Jewish areas outside of the outside of the ghettos. So, for example, in Berlin, we saw last time Berlin was a city that, throughout most of its history, was off limits to Jewish residents, unless you were able to arrange a permit. And you didn't arrange a permit to be there unless you really had some type of uh, what they call protectia. More than that, communities were founded or enlarged owing to the influence of a court Jew. In addition, court Jews were exempted from the jurisdiction of both Jewish and Gentile courts and were accountable for their actions only to the royal court, like other officials of the ruler. Indeed, the court Jew's status resembled that of a high officials in other respects as well. It was appointed to his post by his lord. He bore the title Hofactor or Hofagin and other similar titles and received a salary. Finally, the court Jew also demonstrates his high standing by outward appearance. He's clad, if not entirely in the fashion followed by one of the other states, then in any case, differently from his Jewish brethren. In his household, his attire, and equipage, exhibit his wealth and influence. Uh, this type of Jew who acquires forbearance and standing by serving the politically powerful is no novelty in Jewish history. He's found wherever Jews live among Gentiles and relied on the protection of the mighty. Think of medieval Spain. Uh, um, uh, think of even this figure, let's say, the Barbanel and the role that he played in the Spanish royal court. To serve the masters of the country with money and business acumen gave Jews their best chance to ascend beyond the level of the underprivileged. The Jewish financier and tax farmer of Muslim and Christian Spain are perhaps the most conspicuous examples of this. Still, the court Jews of the 17th and 18th century seemed to have surpassed all their precursors. They were more numerous, their business activities were more extensive, their influence increased, so did their proximity to those in power. No wonder that historians came to regard them as prime movers in what was happening in Jewish society at the time. Um, as tensions with the, with the, as tensions with the Jewish community uh, between the Jewish community and the and the general community grows, there are always questions about what to do with these Jews. This is the proto uh, question, the prototype of the, the the Jewish question, which will be answered by what again the Nazis thought was the final solution to the Jewish question. Of course, there's, thank God, there's not the final solution, but the penultimate solution, the final solution being that, uh, that the Jews really don't belong here, and they need to be in their own place. That's my zip code. Some of you are still living elsewhere. But in the meantime, there were, there were, attempts, to, there were attempts to do other things, to extort the Jews, to try to tax them to death, to... Um, to try to, uh, at different points, to expel them. Um, the, uh, the theological problems of how we can, how we, the Christian society, can allow these infidels to live peaceably in our midst was, from time to time, answered with, with different types of persecution and anti-Semitism, um, subjecting Jews to humiliating restrictions and, and, uh, and the like taxes and uh, uh, badges and ghettos, 
um, etc., etc., etc. Again, these ghettos were were usually really overcrowded. They were dirty. They were squalid. They were fire traps. They were breeding grounds of of, of disease. Jews uh, were only allowed to leave. In, in many cases, were only allowed to leave for business. Um, they were not allowed to leave on Sundays or on other Christian holidays after nightfall. The gates are locked, etc., etc., etc. This is the condition. This is the condition in 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 Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, in in Poland, what we, what we call Poland, what we call Poland, is not exactly uh, what today we call Poland, because the borders of Poland expanded and contracted many times over the years. Poland itself was divided a number of times. Um, sometimes what we call Poland, for the purposes of Jewish history, is really talking about what today is the Ukraine, or uh, or or on the on the eastern side, what's today part of of, of Russia or Lithuania, etc. Uh, the, the parameters of what Poland are and and was are sometimes fluid. And of course, I mean I don't like to make too much of a big deal of it, but we have somebody sitting in Poland with us right now, and he probably knows more about this than I do. I imagine I may. In the old days, did you learn about this stuff in school, Joe? Well, of course, uh, we will learn about uh, all the changes of the Polish, uh, actually, um, uh, which were quite often during the, the probably last thousand years. So um, it, it, it's very difficult to say what was Poland like compared to what is Poland right now, actually. It's not even half of that. So for the purposes of Poland, there are different legends and stories about how how the Jews got to Poland. In other words, the Jews, apparently Jews, after the exile, went up to Rome, and they got up to the the Rhine Valley in Germany, um, probably pretty early, um, the, the sixth, seventh century, something like that. And only later did they start moving eastward towards towards Poland. In, in his collection called Sikure Agadot, Pauline Sikure Agadot, uh, the great the great author Agnon, Shai Agnon. Um, uh, has the following. Now, I, I sent you this this story, this Yiddish story by Reisen to look at. And here we're looking at something from Agnon. And Agnon, of course, is a is a writer of stories. This is not such a story as much as he's recording uh, he's recording uh, fables um, of how the Jews got to Poland. Uh, I, I won't read the whole thing. Um, well, this is the Agadahi. This is uh, the legend. Shalula Poland. Our our forebears. I imagine that most of us, in raise your hand, raise your hand, if you know you are descendant on any side from a Polish Jew. I mean, everybody's hand should be going up. Right. Joel, you should raise your hand. I mean, unless you want to say you're not a descendant of a Polish Jew, that's that's just who you are. Right? So we're all, you know, somehow or other. I mean, it'd be, it'd be remarkable if any of us is like, I and mean, unless there's a society amongst us, I don't know if there's any society amongst us, but if you're an Ashkenazi, the chances are somebody came from, from Poland. Um, unless you're like a yucky, pure bread on, on both sides. Um, so this is the tradition. This is the tradition. Uh, this is the tradition that our forefathers that came from Poland had. 
ראו ישראל שהרדיפות נמשכות והולכות והצרות מתחדשות ובאות והשיבוד הולך לגדול, מלכות הרשע גזירות גוזרת גזירה אחר גזירה, עד שלא הייתה להם תקומה לשונאיהם של ישראל. Things were really bad. Where was it really bad? Wherever the Jews were before they got to Poland. But probably it's talking about Germany before the, or during the Crusades. Um, that the, that the, uh, the, the non-Jews were persecuting us. Amdu al drachim v'sha'aru v'netivot olam. So we, you know, we kind of packed our bags. We headed for the road and we looked around wanting to know where to go. Eze derech yelchu ba'u matsu margoa v'nafsham. What path should we take that we should walk on, that we should find rest for our weary souls? So here's the legend. I mean, until now, it's not a legend. That's black on white history. The Jews, where they were, were being persecuted. Here's the legend. Nachal petek min ha A note fell from heaven. A triple, you know, like a little piece of paper. This idea of receiving d- divine uh, instruction through notes that fall from heaven is a notion that will be picked up in the, in the stories of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and in other Hasidic tales. But it's a type of it's a type of latter day uh, low grade nivua, the idea that we'll get direction from heaven. A note falls from the sky, and the note says, "Lechu lepolin, go to Poland." The Yerchu, the Avo, Arsa Polin, the Yitnu, the Melech, Har Zahav. The Kabel Otam, the Melech, the Chalod Gadol. They get to Poland and they bribe their way in. The Hashem, the Chem Alehem, the Yitnu Otam, the Rachamim, the Fnei Hamelech, the Asari. And things were okay. Um, the, the, the king left them, the king left them live uh, throughout the kingdom. They prosper and they flourish there. They're able to uh, be Jewish. Um, the king defends them against uh, enemies, both foreign and domestic, I guess. Um, and everything initially is okay. Um, uh, what does this remind you of? Does this you know, and Agnon's telling of it, does it ring a bell? But for Agnon, everything always, you know, he's telling the story here, and he's also telling the story elsewhere. Is this, is this, is there, is there a story that's echoing here? Is there an intertext that makes you think? The Jews are in trouble in one place. They come someplace else. The king is very nice to them. He says, Make yourselves at home. The course of that, the course of the Jews' presence, everything is good for the Jews, everything is good for the non-Jewish host society. Yeah, Yosef and Paro. So what's Agnon doing by by weaving the the again? Agnon doesn't invent this this uh, this fable, but in his weaving of it, what's he trying to say? It will think people. If in saying something about the Jews getting to Poland, he's intentionally trying to get us to hear the echoes of the Jews going to Mitzrayim, what's he trying to tell us about the history of the Jews in Poland? Yeah, that, in other words, that ultimately there's going to be some problem. I don't know if he's trying to make a theological statement about Hashem and why he would lead us there. Uh, this is in a midrash. It's a story by Agnon. But that, no, it's not that it's not a good idea to hang out there in Poland. Right? It might be a very good idea to be in Poland if being in Germany means you're going to be killed by the Crusaders. But wherever you're going to go in Galut, even if it's good now, 
even if the Jewish people are saved, or even if uh, uh, Yaakov and sons are saved in Mitzrayim uh, by Paro and, and by Yosef, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have a happy ending. Um, so I think that's probably what you know, Agnon is, is, is echoing here. Um, why is the place called Poland? Poland. 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 Imanu ad shita'alenu le'eretz Yisrael. So things were so good for the Jews in Poland, they say to Hashem, if, if it's not yet time to bring us back to Eretz Yisrael, Hashem, if it's not time for you to bring us back to Eretz Yisrael, ho lim imanu. Here, dwell with us. It's a play on words. I mean, it's a play on words that doesn't work in Polish. Right? But Polin, in other words, in Hebrew, in Hebrew or in Yiddish, it's called Polin. Right? Polin. Dwell here with us until Shtalenu Eretz Yisrael. So there's also something that Agnon is saying. Agnon, the great Zionist, Right. that the idea that they were going to go to Eretz Yisrael on their own was, of course, inconceivable. And probably correctly so. Probably correctly so. Before 1700, the idea that Jews, in any type of organized way, are going to return to Eretz Yisrael is it's just not conceivable. Um, and even then, it doesn't work very, very well. Even though there were always individuals that uh, that went to that went to Eretz Yisrael, um, but the idea of Zionism in its modern sense, of Aliyah in its in its modern sense, um, uh, is is not uh, something that can be considered. The Jews in this regard are completely passive. And Poim, here we'll stay until Hashem will take us back to Eretz Yisrael. So, like all uh, Agnonian texts. So I don't know if, if anybody, you know, done much reading of Agnon. It's, it's a worthy investment. Uh, it's a worthy investment uh, of, of your time. Um, Agnon is, you know, translated into English, uh, but you miss a lot because part of reading Agnon is, is unpacking all of the uh, rimazim, all of the, the hints and echoes of biblical literature, rabbinic literature. Um, but I think that, you know, this is what he's, what he's saying here. Um, Melvin mentions the idea that Poland should be considered a stepping stone on the path to Eretz Israel, just like just like Egypt was. I think that's correct. The Barbanel says something very much like that, although not about Poland. The Barbanel does a scan of the different exiles of the Jewish people. The Jews were kicked out of Spain. They were kicked out of uh, Portugal. After Spain, he goes to Portugal. After Portugal, they go to Italy. Uh, the Jews were kicked out of England. They're kicked out of France. He says it looks like he's speaking then about the 13th, uh, 14th, 15th centuries. He says it looks like the Jews are being the Jews are being uh, emptied out of Western Europe, and they're being pushed towards the east. That the, the whole thing is an attempt to like empty out Europe piece by piece and move people towards Eretz Israel. Well, maybe maybe that's that's the uh, maybe that's the case in Eastern Europe in what we, again, kind of collectively call a Poland, as opposed to Western Europe, there were fewer cities. Let's just look back at that map for a second. Right. Here's, here's Eastern Europe, here's Poland, here's uh, Russia, the Pale of Settlement we have yet to talk about. The Pale of Settlement was like one giant, uh, one giant, um, um, uh, uh, ghetto of sorts, but that comes about later. That comes about 
in the uh, in the 19th century. Um, but most of most of our most most of us that raised their hand, most of us had a, uh, a grandparents or great grandparents uh, that uh, lived someplace you know over here on the map. Um, uh, so in Eastern Europe, there were fewer cities. It was mostly villages. It was a much more agrarian uh, society. Um, so Jews were organized not into these ghettos but into the shtetl. Um, although not all Jews lived in, in what we think of as the shtetl, kind of that, that image that we have. And again, maybe it's formed by watching Fiddler on the Roof too much, but not into ghettos. Um, the shtetl is more like a self-imposed isolation. In the shtetl, Jews were, uh, they, they, they worked in trades, they were innkeepers, they were lumbermen, they were farmers, they were milkmen, they were dairy, dairy farmers. Again, if you if, if you don't have to have seen Shalom Aleichem, let's try to go to high culture. If you you don't you don't have to have seen Fiddler on the Roof, let's try to go to high culture. If you've read uh, Shalom Aleichem, um, so you have a sense of, of what these things what these things were. They weren't um, they were they were able to they were able to move about freely as opposed to the denizens of the, the ghettos in the in the West. Um, but again, it was a type of, of de facto isolation. Jews stayed away from these. Again, I'm speaking in the voice of this character of the the uh, uh, Christians. Uh, the Christians stayed away from the Jews, from you know this character that they saw as a, as a Christ killer, and therefore it was it was a type of de facto self-government. Um, Jews were just more isolated uh, de facto as opposed to de jure opposed to uh, by by the rule of law, but just by kind of the way things things were. The Poles, by and large, you know, left them to themselves as long as the Jews pay their taxes. Um, and therefore, the organized Jewish community, the Kahal, has autonomy in in the areas of its own concern. Taxes go up and up and up in order to keep the Jewish community in business and to kick up the Jews, as it were, to the to the um, to to the non-Jews. So again, by the um, by the mid 18th century, there was great poverty. In Poland, each area was controlled by a it was something called was called the Poryts, the Poryts, who were the kind of uh, counts, um, you know, a lesser a lesser noble. Uh, who was given a certain area to control, and everybody that lived there had to kick up taxes, and he had to kick something up to the up to the king. And uh, generally, the pritzim, the politim, would extort the people that lived on his land in order to cover his his own expenses. One of the major differences, and I guess with this we'll we'll end for tonight. The major differences between Jews in the East and Jews in the West is that in the East, all the Jewish communities were organized, at least from the 16th century on, into what was called the Vad Arba Artsot, the Council of the Four, the Council of the Four Lands. Uh, these were the Jews that lived in Poland, uh, Volynia, which is I guess what Northwest uh, Ukraine today, White Russia, Belarusia, and Lithuania. And 1527, um, 1527, these communities organized themselves into this kind of this kind of um, uh, umbrella organization, the Vad Arba Artsu, and it, it flourished in the 16th and 17th centuries. It, was, it served as kind of like a high court of appeals. Uh, there were regular congresses of rabbinic leadership, of lay leadership. Um, th there, there were these semi-annual fairs, um, trade fairs uh, that would meet, and the, the meetings of the council would coincide with those, with those fairs when people would come together in one kind of central location uh, anyway. Um, Joel, do they still have those things? These kinds of big fairs that take place in the Polish uh, 
countryside and people come from all over? I didn't understand the question, actually. Can you repeat it? In other words, it, it, there, were, there, there was a feature in, in the medieval and early modern period uh, of the, these fairs, these yuridim, where, where uh, people from all the surrounding communities would come together, and it was a trade fair, and it was also something of a, a carnival or a, a circus. These are scenes that appear a lot also in, in Jewish literature from that time. But, but they that. don't have it anymore. I think that they probably end early 19th century. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's similar, I guess, Sherry mentioned, like the country fair in America, but these would also become, these would also become opportunities for, for, um, for uh, the communities, the outlying communities to gather together. Um, and this is not Arba Artsot would represent the Jewish community of all of these areas to the controlling Polish government, and that also, you know, would would uh, be in charge of monitoring the collection of taxes, etc. And this Vad Arba Artsot lasts until the mid 18th century, when it uh, when the Polish government revokes its revokes its power. The the Vad Arba Artsot controlled. The pinkas it was a type of uh, register, a ledger that recorded all of the happenings in the in the communities. We have those pinkasim, those those notebooks, as it were, and those registers. Um, and it's an important, uh, it's a very important source of of, uh, of Jewish history for Eastern European uh, Jewry. We will continue uh, with one more uh, discussion about life. In, in the in this in the shtetl, what that was like, and we'll take a look at this Yiddish story by Abraham Rising. If you haven't read it yet, read it. It's, it's not a long read. Um, again, when you look at a piece of fiction, which is what it is, when you look at a piece of fiction, um, you're not looking at it as a historical document, uh, but it might help you fill in a, a, a gap. If not historical details, then the the spice and the spirit of the the history of the period that you would somehow be lacking otherwise. Um, people that did read the story and sent in a few thoughts obviously picked up on the uh, question of the the role of the woman, of the mother in the story, and what that says about the role of women in in pre-modern society and women in the shtetl. That's all obviously true. But I think there's more going on in the story than this character of Zwate, of the of the mother, um, because I think that there's also there's a lot to be said about the father uh, in the story and the children as well, and what role uh, what role they're playing in the in the in the culture, what role the Jewish books are playing, and what the difference between Jewish books and Jewish learning is, uh, and all those things. So. Take a look at the story. If you read it, read it again and think. Don't be distracted by, by you know, the question of the women's role. Um, also, don't be too anachronistic in in reading too much of our own modern sensibilities about women's roles uh, into the story. Um, and also try to pick a little bit more under the surface and think about what is it saying about society in general. Don't be distracted only by the obvious. Um, question of, of uh, the mother's role, which might jump right off the page at you. Think of what else is going on. Um, no, obviously, it, 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 it was one of his main points, but it's not the only point. I say distract. In other words, don't be distracted. Sometimes, you know, if we wave lights and shoot cannons and, and wave red flags, you notice that. But sometimes that also distracts you from noticing other details that are sometimes painted with a with a finer brush. So uh, we will continue uh, next time. I will stay online if anybody has any questions.